Is Gloria here today? She is. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, discussion uh, nine is on the is on our global. So do Monday, right? Right. Monday. I think it's Monday or something like that. Not incorrect. Um, well, what I remember is Sunday I twisted it in my high heels at mm -hmm. church, and then I didn't think much of it because this is the third I've had surgery on twice, so mm -hmm. I didn't think yeah. anyway. So I was choreographing a dance, and I was practicing um, a triple pirouette, mm -hmm. and I think I just added to it. Probably, yeah. My foot, she says the foot and ankle sprain. And it's swollen and bruised like uh, up to mid calf. Oh. So they have a hard cast on it, or a hard uh, splint. splint. splint it's mm -hmm. like having like half of a cast behind the leg. Right. She Did said you, you yeah. cannot take that off until you go to your doctor. Oh, okay. Ask like your Gracias. Ready? Yeah, whenever you're ready. Right. Well, do you, are you passing out the groceries? You wanted to count we are, your time? As we talk. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Veronica Sinchong, and um, I'm representative of Thomas Aquinas University, and we, we know that senior year of high school is a crucial time in your life as you're deciding which uh, university you'll be choosing, so I just hope that you take heed to our presentation, and good morning. And our friend Matthew here is going to tell, tell you a little bit about our background. Oh yeah, that's us. <laughs> humble, don't mind, don't you tell your humble people. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, well, good morning. We're going to talk, first talk a little bit about scholasticism. What is it? Well, scholasticism was a time in the history of Christian thought. Education was put into the hands of the early church. They brought about a very precise way of thinking. A unique theology to the Middle Ages have now emerged. In the climax of the Middle Ages, all the education was in fact in the church hands. His thoughts were carried on before from the classical philosophy of ancient Greece, early Christian writers, and of course the Bible. And in fact, some great schoolmen emerged from the 9th to 14th century. One of those, of course, being Anselm from Canterbury. <coughs> And if you took the doctrine test yesterday, you might have had a question about him. He's noted for his famous ontological argument where he believes that the thought in our mind of an infinitely perfect creator was put there by a God. Now, if you've ever been in Europe, and I know some of you have in this room, or seen on TV, one thing you would notice is the beautiful cathedrals down in the European landscape. The stained glass windows, the flying buttresses are a beautiful sight to see. But some of these uh, spectacular cathedrals are actually located on campuses of world famous universities. The University of Bologna in Italy, the University of Paris in France, and the oldest university, oldest English speaking university in the whole Oxford are just a few of the many. But what is the relation between the church and these schools? Is there any connection to these modern institutions now and the institutions of the past? Well, the first early schools in the second century were called catechumenal communal schools, or cathedral schools to make it easier. <laughs> These early schools were designed to ready a new convert for baptism. By late second century, the schools began to broaden their curriculum to a, curriculum to a higher level of theological <coughs> training to include philosophy <coughs> and logic. The first goal of the cathedral school was to quell heresy that had worked its way into the church. 
after the death of the, of the apostles. Another goal was to equip Christians of all ages and genders to be able to hold conversations with educated non-believers. Later in the age of Charlemagne, in the 10th and 11th century, in addition to cathedral schools, monasteries were also used for education. Now the monastery was a, a little different place. It was more strict than a cathedral school. Like I said, it was used in addition to the cathedral school. Strict guidelines for spiritual life and personal life. This was not a fun place. Taught under a senior monk. Typically in a monastery, a senior monk was appointed to teach novice monks. And when that novice monk became well known, adult monks from other monasteries would come in with them. Then in the 12th century, cathedral schools began to surpass the monastic way of teaching. Now this is not a casino, but it is one of the <laughs> great monasteries. Now it was from monasteries and cathedral schools that the universities began to rise. The term universitas was coined to describe a guild of the best teachers or scholars who were grouped together in self-defense of Christianity against the town or city where they lived. Now it's difficult to date the exact year of development of the time as the universities uh, sporadically appeared, but early universities were required to obtain a charter from the Pope, which later ones were applied to secular or non-religious ruler for such a charter. Now this map here, it's really hard to read, but that's fine because the point is, if you see all the words along there, these are all universities, so you can see the, how quickly they spread and covered the countryside. Now, studies. There were seven liberal arts studies, uh, seven liberal arts, and if you find in your little brochure, you have the seven, the seven liberal arts under curriculum. Now, Upon completion of the of the uh, cathedral school, the and in the universities, a license to teach was granted. Now, in a basic university, the first four years, you got to pay attention to the time frame here because this gets a little crazy. But the first four years were the seven liberal arts, so you you complete that. Now, you have two years. Uh, an assisted teacher in pursuit of a Master of Arts degree. So now you're at six years deep. Well, after that, you have law, medicine, theology, three graduate facil faculties, and you're looking at another probably four years. So you're looking at ten plus years just to, just to get through the basic uh, university system. Now, the, the student life in Ural universities was a little different than today, and you can think of the CFOT in comparisons of things I'm going to discuss. Of course, they, a small student body was 3,500, uh, and that's pretty pretty small compared to today's universities. But uh, this was at one of the larger universities would have 3,500 scholars. You could begin at the age of 12. Now, in the universities, the women were not necessarily discouraged or encouraged to apply, but they were not banned from going to the universities. But it was mostly men. Women who wanted to study were encouraged to study on things in the household, like cooking and. and and doing other chores around the house. But a woman wasn't banned, but strongly discouraged. You also need a requirement of Latin to get into the universities. Now we go to learning cost, tuition. We all know what we pay for tuition here. Well, what do we get a lot of here? We got a lot of books, right? Well, not so in these days. Books were quite expensive. Only the very, very rich had books. And the very, very rich, most of them didn't attend the attend the schools. So what you did was each class you'd come into, you'd pay a fee to the instructor. And for that fee, you got to listen to his lesson and his commentaries. And you didn't have this little luxury of paper either because paper was also expensive. So you had to remember everything. So think about your hardest class here. Let me think about Doctrine or, or Garrington's class and having just to remember everything. In addition to some rough life, just in trying to get your studies done, there were strict rules. Now, some of those are similar to here. No swearing or gambling is allowed here. 
Of course, we don't have a curfew, but in those days, you were fined for violating your curfew. Pristine table manners were required. That's kind of required here. Mm -hmm. uh, and the distances traveled to schools was quite far. Mm -hmm. So, this is where the actual stain of the school began. Teachers began to rip rooms to the students. Now, most of the aspects of the universities was taught the students on how to think and ask questions. And it also involved some pretty serious arguments. And even the doctrine of Christianity began to be scrutinized. However, people were learning to think and ask questions. The scholastic debates arose often involved many and would lead into town squares and even in barns where some of these discussions would take place in the countryside. Accepting authorities' traditional knowledge was no longer a given. But one of those great thinkers who emerged was Thomas and Aquinas. We're leading into the next segment. He's going to be discussed in part two of this. But the question I asked before was what was the connection between these modern universities and today? Well, in this day and age, we still see the fruits of the Christian, early Christian education. Universities in our own country, like Georgetown, Loyola, Creighton, and even nearby Notre Dame, are reminders of the history of the church and education dating back over 1,800 years. Thank you, Matthew. And if you can switch the next thing. In your pamphlet here, you'll see um, a snippet about our founder. I, is it Aquinas or I say Aquinas? I don't Aquinas. know. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about him and his influence. So he was born um, to um, Count of Aquino and his mother, um, Countess, actually. Let me say this fact really quickly. Um, so his nickname was the Dumb Ox, mm -hmm. and the reason why he was uh, granted that name was he uh, was very tall and erect. He can go ahead and switch to the next one. He had a large build, and, and his classmates would often think of um, his shy behavior, his shy attitude as um, him being stupid, um, not knowing anything. But here we have Albert Magnus, who I'll talk about a little more. He's one of his teachers, and this is a quote that's pretty famous. It says, we call this young man a dumb ox, but his bellowing and doctrine will one day resound throughout the world. And we can see that um, evident in universities in many areas of um, doctrine and theology. So his early life, he was, like I said, he was born to Count of Aquino, and um, his mother was Countess of Teano. He was a Dominican monk, um, which actually he wasn't born a Dominican monk, but when he was 19, he joined the Dominican friars. Um, he was influenced a lot, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, about, he was influenced by Aristotle. Um, a lot of his teachings and thinking um, came about because he had to defend a lot of things that were misconstrued about Aristotle's teaching. And um, his mother, actually, when he was younger, his mother was, his parents both thought that they would train with um, the Benedict, Benedictine monks. And so because of his decision to join the Dominican monks, and actually um, the leader of the Dominican monks was, they were kind of poor, the, their standard was a little more poor than the, the Benedictine, and so his parents were a little shocked by his decision, so they decided to kidnap him, mm -hmm. and um, before that, uh, the friars, the Dominican friars, were kind of nervous that that would happen, so they sent him to Rome, but actually his brothers were in the military, so they saw him when he was there, and so his brothers actually scooped him up, and he was um, held hostage for two years. <laughs> two years in the castle. And um, it actually, I read a lot about how during that time, his sister was actually able to retrieve some books. And uh, the three main things that he used were, um, excuse me for a second, he used, um, well, he used scripture. Um, he read a lot about that. He read about Aristotle's metaphysics. And he read sentences, which is a Peter Lombard um, um, book, I guess I should say. But that's what he read a lot when he was in captivity. So his time wasn't wasted there. He got a lot of reading um, during this time of captivity. Then um, his mother feared um, Pope Innocent. Actually, there were threats for him being in captivity because they knew that his teachings would carry out regardless of him being captive. And so they feared that something would happen, so his mother liberated him. And he was actually sent to... Um, he was sent to the University of Naples at around the age of 22, and that's where he was introduced to Albertus Magnus. And actually, that should have been this should have been Albertus Magnus um, because his, he was already influenced by Aristotle before he went to Naples. 
and his teachings. You can go ahead and flip it in there. Put the picture there. This is Albertus Magnus, and we'll just call him Albert. Go ahead. So after he um, <clears throat> he was in he was in Naples, he was kidnapped, and then he was sent to the University of Paris, and he was actually taught in grammar and a lot of the things that Matthew said, um, arithmetic, astrology, and he was very, he stood out among his peers. Um, even when he was younger, at the age of five, he was sent, it was, it was, it was common in that culture by the age of five to be able to get trained, and even when he was at the age of five, people recognized his dedication to prayer, people read, recognized his um, ability to, I guess, think critically even at such a young age. And so the same thing happened in the University of Paris. He stood out among his peers. He even surpassed, um, they said that by the end of his life, he even surpassed the thinking of Albertus Magnus, who was already a very renowned um, theologian in the Dominican Friars at that time. Um, let's see. So he, um, like I said, he, a lot of his writing was to defend Aristotle. And... But he, he didn't, he, so he was a follower of Aristotle, but he didn't do it blindly. So what I mean by that is that he didn't agree with Aristotle's teachings, anything that disagreed with the church. He didn't follow those. Um, for instance, teaching that the universe was eternal with no beginning. Um, but he felt that he needed to, to correct a lot of the things that were written incorrectly about Aristotle. Um, there's Aristotle there. And so a lot of his work, I'm talking quickly, a lot of his works, um, they were about, he lived about 50 years and he wrote about 60 things. Although some things were miscredited to him, they said a lot of his followers had written things and they just gave it the credit to, um, to Thomas. So some of his works were disputed questions of truth, which this was very popular in, in the university because it proposed a lot of questions that would help students think through doctrine with like moral issues, with, issues of evil, and what it was is it had the question, and it's kind of like across the spectrum book, the one that we have in Doctrine, like it proposes each side of the spectrum, and then kind of has arguing points on each, and so, and he would conclude each question with his own opinion on it. But the most influential work was the Summa Theologica, which means the sum of theology, and that one, um, there's a lot to know about that one, but I'm going to try to tell you in just a few minutes. Um, it basically was, it was considered the Christian doctrine for students, and it arranged theology in the summary of Christian philosophy, and um, a lot of times it was considered as a systemized theology, or it was a way that theology um, was summed up to, let me say that again, um, I want to see how it states it here. Okay, so he, this is a quote that he had upon writing it. He said, I wish to avoid these familiar drawbacks, similar drawbacks. We shall endeavor, confiding in the divine assistance, to treat of these things that pertain to sacred doctrine with brevity and clearness, insofar as the subject to be treated will permit. So he, um, so again, he wrote a lot of arguments and a lot of questions that had to do with theology and doctrine, and he uses a lot of faith and reason and he wanted to prove a few things. He wanted to prove that um, reason is used in theology, not to prove the truths of faith, which are accepted authority of God, but to defend and explain the doctrines revealed. And so um, he wanted to use, he wanted to point out that revelation was also needed um, for salvation. So reason is needed, but so is revelation. And in this book, it was broken up into several parts. I think the total uh, amount of articles and questions was actually, um, it had 38 summaries, 612 questions, 3,102 articles, and about 10,000 objections and proposed answers. And it took about 8 to 10 years of his life. And actually, um, you go to the next one, I don't know if I have. Okay, not that yet. Um, but on his, he didn't finish it before he died. Um, he was on the last section on the third part before he died, and um, but again, it was had said to be completed by some of his like followers who just grabbed other portions of other works and put it together. Um, so in the <clears throat> the first part, he talked a lot about um, 
like man as a possession of God. In the second part, he talked about human acts and like virtues. In the third part, he talked about Christ. But overall, he summarized uh, faith and reason. And um, this is a quote that he said while he was on his deathbed. He said, if in this world there be any knowledge of the sacrament stronger than that of faith, I wish now to use it, affirming that I firmly believe and know as certain that Jesus Christ, true God and true man, Son of God and Son of Virgin, Mary, in this sacrament, is in this sacrament. I receive thee, the price of my redemption, for whose love I have watched, studied, and labored. Thee have I preached, thee have I taught, never have I said anything against thee. If anything was not well said, that is to be attributed to my ignorance. Neither do I wish to obstinate in my opinions, but if I have written anything erroneous concerning the sacrament or any other matters, I submit all the judgment and correction of the Holy Roman Church and whose obedience I now pass from this life. And another thing that he was known for was to experience ages of ecstasy, which was just this moment of supernatural um, leading. Uh, it was reported that he would be he would get direction in his writing from like angels. He would be seen like in a chapel just uh, talking to the, the voice of the Lord. Um, and so that was that was one of the things that contributed to his writings. Um, so there was a supernatural aspect um, that made his writings so grand, I guess. Go to the next one. And this is actually his, um, this is in a Dominican church. Um, the name is Jacobian Church. And this is where um, he is buried. And actually, uh, one of his monuments, or one of his um, tombstones was destroyed. So actually, different parts of his body are in different places in Europe. So um, I'm not sure what's here. I don't really <laughs> get into that. But I know that like you, um, after being destroyed from originally being in the Dominican church, that's where he is now. And so the legacy, these are some of the names that have been given to him. Um, he's been known as the doctor of the Universal Church, the prince and master of all scholastic doctors, patron of all Catholic universities, academies, colleges, and schools throughout the world. And that's the last picture there. But in our church history books, as Shelley points out, um, so the universities were created to be able to understand and explain God's truth. And there was a need to have a reconciliation between doctrine and between, um, between Christian, between faith. So he Thomas Aquinas was able to tie the two together to, um, to kind of have a reconciliation between the two. And that is all I have about Thomas Aquinas and universities. Do you have any questions? Tuition is ten million dollars. Yes, there is financial aid available. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much.